This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Michigan Studios of WKTV. Let's go inside for Silent Voices. Queena, could you please come to the mic? Good evening, gentlemen. Um, I have a very long story, so I'm not going to have so much eye contact because I'm going to read. Um, my name is Queena. I'm from Kent County. Um, I've had four daughters removed from me from Child Protective Services. In September 2007, my medically fragile daughter, who has been diagnosed with cerebral palsy, hydrocephalus with three shunts, she's tracheostomy dependent, feeding tube dependent, bilateral subdural hemorrhaging, hypothermia, and seizure disorder was removed from my care. CPS testified that I was unable to meet her medical needs and take care of my two daughters at the same time. When my fragile child was removed, CPS also testified that I was doing a great job with my other two daughters and I was pregnant with my fourth daughter. So Judge Gardner left my two daughters in my care but making them temporary wards of the court. I was then assigned to a treatment plan through DA Blodgett where I was told to take many different classes. I was only given one hour a week visits with my medically fragile child and was told to meet all of her doctor's appointments. When my medically fragile child was in my care, we had in-home health care nurses through Maxim Health Care Facility, eight hours a day, seven days a week. So there was medical tension on site. I was fully trained to take care of the needs of my daughter, and I did a very good job with no complaints from the doctors or the nurses. In November of 2007, I was brought again in front of Judge Gardner, where DA Blodgett and all other workers testified that I was doing a good job but needed to find more affordable housing. I was managing my rent, and bills were zero balance, but DA Blodgett felt I need to be living in transitional housing. So I was told I had 24 hours to move from my current residents to help community transitional housing for women unless my children were going to be removed from me so I did as they requested. I then worked with two case managers through Strong Beginnings, Kent County Health Department, public health nurses, child development specialists, DA Blodgett social worker. At the next court hearing I was told that everything was going fine and that I would be and that I would be reunified with my medically fragile child. I was given my Section 8 through Hope Community, and DA Blodgett's social worker told me I had to turn it down and stay in transitional housing. My medically fragile chi child started having more medical conditions, and I started appearing at visit. She started appearing at visits with bleeding trachs and bed sores all over her body. The worker at DA Blodgett told me that everything was fine, but it was not. So as I continued, I was meeting my treatment plan, appointments, and expectations. My fourth daughter was born in March of 2008. My lawyer counseled me to plead guilty once again, making my infant a temporary ward of the court. In the first week of June 2008, I was again at court in front of Judge Gardner where I was told we would have reunification for my medically fragile child to be returned to my care. Workers expressed that I was doing a great job with the girls and meeting all of the requirements. While two weeks after this meeting, there was a miscommunication that I had tried to commit suicide. Although I was living in Hope Community and case managers there spoke with worker at DA Blodgett and ensured her that everything was fine, June 20th, there was a hearing in front of a referee removing all of my children from my care. The referee specifically stated that my children should go to immediate family first, but DA Blodgett ignored the judge's wishes and placed my kids in foster care, denying everyone in my family a chance. The judge stated that stated that I go under treatment to determine if I was suicidal and once that was ruled out my children would be returned home to me. Within a week's time it was ruled out that I was not suicidal, my children were not home. We were supposed to appear in court the last week of June but for reasons inadequately explained court was adjourned until July. Then in July court was adjourned again until September for a permanency planning. Before I went to this court date I met with social worker at DA Blodgett and she asked me to choose between my medically fragile child and my other three daughters. Then she said either one for three or three for one. I chose not to make the, deal, make the deal. In the month of September, Judge Gardner said she would return my children in December of 2008 and reunification for my medically fragile child and a permanency planning for the girls. Less than 30 days later after this, I received a petition for termination of my medically fragile child. So the hearing in December was 
a termination and a permanency planning. Then for reasons not explained, court was adjourned and then scheduled for February 2009, where I then received papers for termination to all four of my girls. The period of that time, my children were in foster care. My eight-year-old at the time, my eight-year-old at this time, she was six. She was hit in her mouth by her foster care. Uh, mother. I called Child Protective Services where the foster admitted to the incident and she was given eight hours of parenting classes. My child remained in her care. I was given one hour with my medically fragile child and one hour with my other girls, including my infant who was only two months when she was removed from my home. My children were not placed with family and were all separated with strangers. They appeared several times with black and blue bruises on their arms and wrists. My oldest was in the home with a member of DA Blodgett's staff while the other children were separated. I was also told that at every visit I had to bring dinner for my children because they would be hungry. I had no problem with this, but it made me feel as if though they were not being fed. Also in December 2009, my DA Blodgett worker was switched to an intern who was still studying her trade in Lansing, Michigan, so she pre-scheduled all of our visits. In February 2009, my parental rights were terminated, and I was not given my last visit to say goodbye to my girls. Everyone who was subpoenaed to come to my court did not show up. Judge Gardner's undisputed testimony was that she knows that I love my children and that we have a strong bond, but she has to terminate my rights anyways. I appealed my case, and the appeal lawyer stated that they cited seven statutory grounds for termination, but four were clearly violated. Prosecutors did not state in their closing arguments how the children were, would be harmed if returned back to my care. My children have been adopted out. I have not seen nor heard of their whereabouts since February 2009. I had another child born in July 2009 in the state of Mississippi where I live with my mother. I came back to Michigan in April 2010 where I was seen by CPS and the very next day a petition for removal of my son was issued. My son was not removed. CPS said if I left Michigan within 24 hours, they would close the case. They gave me $300 worth of gas money and a $100 voucher to family fare, so me and my son left. A sheriff from Mississippi, Clay County in Mississippi, was called to come to my home to check to see if me and my son were there. Then they called back to CPS in Michigan stating that they placed eyes on us, and two weeks later I received a petition from Judge Garter stating, stating that my case was closed and everyone was discharged from my case. I am currently a resident of the state of Michigan and hopes that CPS will not not try to take my son again or the child that I am pregnant with now. Mr. Bob Gant, please come to the mic. My name is Bob Gant. I'm from Midland. Uh, cases in Kent County. And it's about the uh, removal and placement of my grandson, Bradley, uh, mainly the placement. Uh, Kay Bailinga, the CPS worker, falsified a referral and lied about a hair follicle test in the court when she was ready to take Bradley, which was when the adoptive couple, Eric and Dr. Kathleen, no last name, uh, got their foster license. This was planned three months earlier when the adoptive couple started the process. Kay and Margo, Bradley's paternal grandmother, conspired to have Chris, Bradley's mother, lose him at the next quarterly hearing on December 6th of 06. There was already a permanency plan of adoption in place at the time of her removal. Margo was the only relative D.A. Blodgett had contact with until we contacted them a month later after Chris didn't show up for Christmas and we were finally able to track Bradley down. From then on, one thing after another, D.A. Blodgett started transition to the adoptive couple right after we contacted them expressing interest in custody of Bradley. They made formal placement the day after we made an appointment to come down here. They told us foster care licensing would be quicker than an adoption process and that all the paperwork would transfer when the time came. It didn't. Heather Moorcourt, the foster care licensing worker, asked if we'd be interested in another child. They had an adoptive conference with Eric and Kathleen days after our first meeting. Remember, these people were newly provisional and only had permanent placement for a few days. 
They claimed they didn't know how to contact us and said they sent a letter to Roxanne's, my wife, old address. We had given our address and phone number to Kay Bilingua back in January of 06, which she noted in one of her reports. Sufficient, oh, okay. They would only give us one hour per month visitation and didn't want his sister to visit at all. I think this was to break the ties, bonds. From the OCO report, sufficient steps were not taken for sibling placement. They did not locate, identify possible relative placements within 30 days. Bradley was improperly placed with the adopted family because it was past 30 days and the original placement, uh, oh, past 30 days of the original placement and removal was not requested. They didn't decide on relatives wanting placement within 90 days. When the relative assessment was done, it was not in compliance. This is a quote, the agency delayed the process. During phone conversations with the OCO, when I pressed as to why DA Blodgett was doing this, I was told I didn't understand promises had been made. And they do this all the time. And the only way to make things change is if people were like me were to take it all away. When we first met Margo, before she knew we were trying to get Bradley, she told me they promised to help her with her medical problems that she didn't interfere with her plans. She later said at the termination hearing that she, had, that she was working for CPS and she had made the last referral. A case outcome, DA Blodgett approved us for adoption just not our grandson Bradley. And the MCI Bill Johnson gave five reasons for denial that had nothing to do with my wife Roxanne. We, we were not married at, at the time. Okay, one second. Try and wrap it up. I'm almost done. Roxanne and I were approved for adoption by a private adoption agency. And Bradley's court appointed lawyer recommended placement with us. Thank you. Ms. Sally Borges, please come to the mic. Hello, I'm Sally Borghese, and I'm the grandmother in a case. So we got another grandparent case here, and um, you have a copy of my case also. <clears throat> And I'll read it to you, um, some of the case history. The children were removed from the mother's custody with a charge of neglect. However, the grandmother, myself, had been raising the children for over eight years. CPS sought to give grandmother relative caregiver status of the five-year-old. The court placed the 13-year-old in care of his father. There is case law that states that the state has no interest when a parent has placed a child in the care of a relative and that relative is willing and able. Therefore, the court did not have subject matter jurisdiction, but assumed it anyway. The Court of Appeals has reversed similar cases on subject matter jurisdiction. No abuse or neglect were ever mentioned towards myself, only excellent care and a loving relationship. I would have adopted my five-year-old granddaughter without any funding, which is a stipulation of qualifying a child prior to the state receiving federal funding. Therefore, it can only be assumed that D.A. Blodgett had a goal of receiving federal funding by placing the five-year-old into adoption. The Michigan Children's Institute Superintendent, Bill Johnson, after receiving the case from the judge, had said he would return my granddaughter. However, once he found that D.A. Blodgett had qualified her for the Title IV-A, the main qualifier of Social Security, for the federal funding, he changed his mind. He stated that I was too old, yet I had been raising my granddaughter from birth. I raised her to the age of five years and 33 days. She was, um, let's see, she was placed 
with the Fosters seven months prior to parental termination and immediately told they were adopting her. In sworn testimony, the MCI, Bill Johnson, stated that my granddaughter had been told her parents were in heaven, and this is not so. They are both alive today. Of course, having a brother, she would eventually see someday she would learn the truth. It can only be assumed that all those involved in the case might not have the welfare of the child in mind knowing she would learn the truth after coming of age when the federal funding would then cease. The Michigan Office of Children Ombudsman investigated the case and could find no reason that my granddaughter should have been removed from me. The Ombudsman cited D.A. Blodgett for several violations. The MCI jo Bill Johnson, under sworn testimony, admitted that the state has allowed persons older than myself to adopt. So the case outcome, there were no exigent circumstances to remove my granddaughter from me, but D.A. Blodgett had her one hour after the judge gave a recommendation to put her into foster care, which happened on Valentine's Day 2005. She's been gone over six years, and the adoptive family prefers that her brother does not visit or call her, and I have never seen her since she's been gone, nor have any other relatives. Thank you. Okay, before our next person, remember, speak up loud, okay? Ms. Benta, could you come to the microphone, please? Hi, my name is Binta Ba. Uh, I'm from Africa. I came here in uh, 2001. I came with my two sons. In 2004, I have my daughter. So 2004, they take my two sons away from me. And I don't know why they took that away from me. People say, they say, they say, they say. They come, they took that away from me. And my husband just came from Africa. She said, why these people are taking our children? I said, I don't know. So we went to Batani. They say we to go take um, parenting classes. My husband just came. She said, why are we taking parenting classes? What do we do? So we say, no, we're not going to take parenting class because we in Africa, we believe in America is a justice country. That's why we come here. We think they're going to give we justice. So we find out a friend, missionary. She said, no, you guys just go take parenting classes. So my husband said, if we go take parenting class, we don't, we don't know what we do. What? That makes sense? So she said, no, you guys go. We went, we take parenting classes, we do psychological. We went to visit the children. So in that 2004, so I have my daughter. They went to the hospital. But they didn't take my daughter. They went with police. And my husband called the same missionary lady. So she came there. They said, you just want to see my daughter. But they're not going to take my daughter. So then I went with my daughter home. So we went to visit these children. We brought these children home. Then these children coming home in 2000, uh, end of 2004, my husband is leaving, going out. Then the children came, so I'm struggling with the children. It's so overwhelming for me. My husband leave, the children come home. So I'm struggling. So because of that day, I take all my love for my husband I put into the children. So I said, okay, my oldest son, he was 15. I said, well, you help me now because your dad lives now. So I look for another second job. So I'm working two jobs now. And taking my daughter to daycare and working two jobs. My son are going to school. So then the other lady who was coming to my house, she said, whenever you have problem, he said, call me. He said, call me. I said, OK. Then my young, older son started giving me problem again. Then I take phone, I went to work, I take phone, I call somebody from the CPS lady. I say, hey, I need help. She said, which kind of help do you need? I said, well, you guys take my son 2004, you guys brought them home and they are giving me problem again. You guys said to call you guys. She said, how old are your son again? I said, 15. She banned the phone. She said, we cannot help you. 
then I become lost as me as a stranger. I become lost. A week later, my son hit me in my face. Blood start, starting dropping in my face. Then I call the police. The police come and take picture in my face. He said, where your son? I said, my son run away, he go out. He said, okay, we're gonna put him in jail. I said, no, don't put him in jail. I said, it's my son, I just need help. I call these people to help me, they refuse to help me, I call you to help me. You say, gonna put him in jail. I said, no, don't put him in jail. I said, I just need help, somebody to talk to my son. Then my son was having a big brother. This big brother came and take my son to his house and called uh, an other agency, this big brother agency, told them, say, my son is 18, he living with, with my son. My son living with Trump. Then I told the youngest one, who is 13, I said, hey, I want you guy, we to move, I want you, me and you and my daughter to move to go to another state because I don't want you to let these people to take you guy. My younger son said, no, ma, I don't want to leave to go to another state. I said, because I lose Mohammed, I don't want to lose you again. I don't want to lose my daughter. She said, I have friends in here. I said, OK, if you have friends here, when you went to another state, you will have friends in there too. Then he went to school. He tell the school, say, my mom say, you're going to drown me or you're going to poison me. CPS tried to get hold of me, but they couldn't get hold of me because I work two jobs. I go from the other job to the other job, and at night I pick up my daughter, I brought them home. Then that day, day I went to, to the daycare lady to pick up my daughter. No, before that I came to house, I get a message, but I didn't understand this message because I don't have no idea. Then when I went to daycare, the daycare said, hey, don't go home. I said, don't go home, what happened? He said, they come to take your daughter. I said, who? He said, CPS. I said, what happened? He said, I don't know. He said, don't go home. I said, hey, I'm going to go home. I said, when you believe in God, I said, anything is possible. I don't do nothing wrong. Then as I reach home, <coughs> I see two police came stand. They took my daughter. I said, why? They said, because you're going to drown your son or poison your you poison him. Then they said to go to court. I say I'm tired. I'm not going to court anymore. I say I'm not going to court anymore. Then they said go to court. I went to court. I take all the psychological, parenting classes, everything without no proof, no nothing. End of the day, they went to my refugee document from Africa. Then say I have a trauma from Africa. I say no. The trauma I came to get in America is worse than Africa. I said, because in Africa, I came here to get freedom and to get life. Now look the life I'm getting here. I said, look, talk about this problem. This one is worse. I don't have mother here. I don't have father here. I depend on the government. The government give me promise to come here without no family. They will take care of me and give me justice. Now look me here. I stand by myself, no family. Look all this paper I have. No proof, no nothing. Tell me true. What is the difference, Africa and here? What we say, our government, they're not helping us, they are corrupt, they're not giving freedom. It's just no more me to disappear, to get fed up. I don't have no family member, just friends here. Please help me to get my children. It's not only me, but for all Americans who good mothers. Good evening, everybody. Um, I was not supposed to be here. So I guess God didn't prompt me to be here. Um, gentlemen, appreciate you being here. Everybody, appreciate you being here. Now, I don't know where to start. I'm gonna let you know. I'm from King County. My child has not been taken, okay? Now, the first experience I did have with CPS was in 2009 through a school system, okay? Um, at that point, I had, um, talk to them because my son was not getting his services. He's emotionally impaired, was not getting his services. Um, they got angry with me because I pointed out this, that, and the other, okay? Um, eventually, since they did not want to give him these services, one day they had called me and said that my son, uh, son's clothes were wet, okay? Um, and I didn't think anything of it. I went, brought him a change of clothes, 
uh, upon him returning home, he had soiled clothes. I said, that smells bad. You know, I said, go take it and put it down in the washer. He said to me, I said to him, I says, um, he says, well, I got to take this bag back. I said, what do you mean you got to take this bag back? Well, Miss So-and-so wants her bag back. Oh, really? I said, it smells like urine. Didn't dawn on me that at the time when they called me, I didn't ask them, was it urine? Was it whatever? Okay. But anyways, he told me that a teacher made him, um, would not let him go to the bathroom. Okay. And so he urinated on himself, okay? And he cried when he told me this. I was highly upset. Then again, I went up there, talked to them, and then all of a sudden CPS was called on me, okay? This lady, in, in turn, apparently had talked to my son first. Then, um, well, when I came to pick him up, I could tell just by his teacher's look, she wouldn't look me in the eye, that something had happened, you know? And something was going on. Like I said, got home, found the card, then, in turn, um, my son came home and told me. Someone was there questioning me, Mom, because he knows not to talk to strangers. Anyways, after that, I called the lady, and I asked her. I said, ma'am, I'm Mrs. Bishop. I'm so-and-so, so-and-so's mom. I'd like to know what's going on. Well, um, we got a report, and they said that um, your son has, a, uh, has the um, intelligence of a two-year-old, and... Um, that uh, you took your son to the casino and he slept in the back and didn't eat. I says, ma'am, I says, you know something, who would say such a thing? I says, you tell me who reported such evil stuff? And then, you know, I got to thinking about his teacher and how she got mad at me when I was speaking in reference to his services. And she had said to me, um, well, you know, your son finds it hard to say certain things. And I says, well, what do you mean? Say certain things to who? Well, I thank you. And I told her, I says, well, you know what? Me and my son, we have a relationship. And you know something, if he has a problem, he knows that he can come to me. I said, just like he's come to me about anything. And just like he's come to me about you guys not giving him his services and him urinating on himself and you guys not letting him go to the bathroom. So that was the first episode, okay? Now, this, uh, that was 2009. Now this is 2011. I transferred my son from one school to another this year. So he's been to two schools this year. First school, I called CPS on them because my son was assaulted by six of the staff members, okay? GRPD would not take it serious. They uh, coached the school on what to do and what to say to me. Um, and it was a long drawn out situation, okay? I still have documentation on all of that. Um, they refused to prosecute them. Now, I moved him from this school to another school. And like I said, I called uh, CPS. They would not take my uh, complaint because they said I'm not, uh, the school is not a caregiver. And if the school is not a caregiver, then I don't know what they are because I'm an educator myself. And I'm a caregiver. Each time any one of your students, any one of your kids come, I'm a surrogate parent, I'm a caregiver, I'm everything that I'm supposed to be. Whatever God says I am, I am for them at that time. Okay, now wrapping up, um, just recently, I'm gonna say last month on the 19th, CPS came to my son's school. My son was assaulted on the 1st, no, on the 29th of May. And CPS came to the school there, um, and I called them again. And when the school calls and I call, at least take that database, put it together, so that you're not running around like a goose with your head cut off and you look like fools. Anyways, what ended up happening, since the woman had assaulted my son, socked him in the back, and threatened to hit him with a baseball mat, met, um, I sent a tape with my son every day to school, eight hours worth of taping. They, they neglected my son from the 16th to the 20th, would not let him go to school, kept him in their office, okay? Then turn around, when I told CPS that I taped them, what do you think happened now, okay?